spaces where you are where you guys coming in from we want to hear from you and uh, understand where you're at and around the world we are in sydney all of all us three are in sydney chris is in obviously in cali where are you guys at it's nice to see your faces holly beck you're the first one on the call well played <laughs> jamie is coming in from scotland oh my god it must be late up there for you mate there's a lot of people uh, around the world that showed interest in this so we're really excited to share the wow love around the world so, uh, yeah, where are you coming in from? Drop in the chat and give us any questions you might have in the lead up. We're keen to understand what you guys are keen to find out. Manhattan Beach. Uh, and if there's anything in particular that you guys want to uh, understand or get to know through this presentation, this is your chance to really throw it at us now. We're super flexible. We're, we're going to run through a bit of a, a template, a bit of a structure that we've got in mind. All three of us are going to be speaking to you at different points of this presentation. But at the same time, we are loving the fact that you guys can help steer this as well. This is very much interactive and live, and we want to hear from all of you. So if there's any other good things, South Sydney. Look at that. Mark's coming in from South Sydney. How good. <laughs> Represent Cronulla. That's unreal. All righty. So we've got a few more people trickling in now, and we'll get going in a couple of minutes. But if there's anything you guys want to say or, or um, step up and jump into, look at this. Wrightsville Beach. NC, which, what's that new Carolina? North what, Carolina. North Carolina. Carolina, yeah. Okay, it's yeah. not all Carolina, about Australia, Carolina. Joel. <laughs> Sorry, I got to give a shout out. Windsor, Ontario in the house. That's my hometown. Represent. Woo! Oh, yeah, we got Canadian representing. Hey. Hey, Alyssa, your fan club, Mark? I don't know, Alyssa Lozon. Hi, Alyssa. You know I'm sure. <laughs> I listened to you on um, the podcast with, what's his name, the other day. Oh, awesome. Matt Barnes. Yeah, yeah. So that, Wait, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I tell you what, Alyssa, you must have done something right for, for you to follow him over here. Well played. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Check this out. We've got, we've got Nicaragua. We've got Ecuador, Ecuador, Auckland, New Zealand. How good is this? Joel, can you explain our snaps? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we often will give people good vibes by throwing them snaps, and that's all about being able to not cover up what they're saying by clapping. We can't hear you when we clap, so we're going to give you snaps instead. So throughout this presentation, you might see us even on mute going snaps. Like that's that's fucking rad. So you guys can absolutely throw snaps when you think something's cool. But yeah, that's what it's all about. And it came from our friends, first of all, I think over in South Africa at Waves for Change. Sweet as, I reckon we can almost get going. I don't have a number count of how many are in this call. What do we got, Chris? I think we're almost at 30 and... Yep. You know, like I said, people will trickle in, but I think it's 4.05. We've got an hour with all of you fine humans. And so I think we get started. Sweet. And just before we do, guys, drop in the chat where you're at. If you just jumped in, we want to understand where you're coming in live from around the world. Over to you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. A big aloha to all of you. My name is Chris Promacio, proud Hawaiian Filipina. I have the fortunate benefit of being a part of this unique network of individuals striving to advance the surf therapy sector as a co-founder of our nonprofit ISTO in 2017. And some of our co-founders are on this as well. We support the world's leading surf therapy practitioners, researchers, clinicians, scholars, and students who want to further the sector through additional research. Our mission is to enable more access to safe and inclusive surf therapy. And we have become the number one resource center for sharing in the practitioner community. One way is through our annual conferences. More on that later. We also host monthly workshops. Those are broken up based on population served. Please join us when you can. We actually have our adult healing from trauma working group right after this. And we have these quarterly webinars for all of you to learn, engage, and connect with some of our veterans in the surf therapy community. And I'm not saying you're old, Joel, Mark, or Phil, simply that you've been doing your surf therapy thing for quite a while now. As you know, surf therapy is an emerging field for mental health support, and it's an honor to unite our colleagues from around the globe in this space. So thank you for being here today. Before we officially start our session, the WOW crew. I want to make an important acknowledgement here in the Los Angeles basin. 
or ISTO's headquarters. We are located on the indigenous land of the Gabrielano Tongva Native Indians of California. So if you know your indigenous land, please, as Joel mentioned, uh, share it in the chat. Your city, country, or region is great. And moving forward, I implore you to find out the name of the indigenous people who came before you on the beautiful land in which you play, work, love, and surf on to thank them in your very own way. So with all that, take it away, Foundation Wow and mahalo. Love it, Chris. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to check, are you recording already? Perfect. Well, happy days. Welcome, guys. It's so good to be here. And thank you so much for the warm welcome, Chris. It is unreal to be a part of the ISTO family and to have you guys a part of the WOW family. We're going to dive into a very interactive session over the next 60 minutes. And we're really keen for you guys to play a part. If you're watching this after the fact, then we want you to get in touch with any questions you might have. And, uh, and yeah, send us your good vibes from all around the world. So we've got myself, We've got Mark and Phil all speaking today, all a part of the WOW family, and we're going to be running through everything to do with Waves of Wellness. We're doing a deep dive into our programs, how we respond to trauma, the 17 different kinds of programs that we run at Waves of Wellness, and how we bring the WOW factor to, to life, basically. So the, just a funny fact before we get going, my mute button won't let me press it. So I'm going to always be on, on loud this time and I'm feeling really crook. So I've got my box of tissues and if I snuffle, I really apologize for that. <laughs> what a shit show. All right. Okay. So we're rocking and rolling into this. What you can expect to, uh, to see today, guys, is a bit of a history, the impact, the programs that we run, managing those group dynamics, which all of you will see in various you know, settings and programs around the world. We're going to talk a lot about the research side of things and the importance of that data collection, as well as looking forward into the future and how we can all prepare for that. And there's going to be a great chance for Q&A at the end of today, but we want you guys to be able to answer questions as they come up. Or should I say, we want to answer your questions as they come up. So if you've got any questions, drop them into the chat. It's always good to have the chat box open down to the right-hand corner. And then you can see as people are talking about things throughout the conversation, you can add to that conversation and ask a little extra things. All righty, let's get into it. Let's crack on. So the WOW family, like we say, we are the WOW family. Everyone that comes into contact with WOW is the WOW family. So that means you are now as well. So it's good to have you part of this. And speaking of, the ISTO family is an even bigger family, which we are very, very excited to be a part of. Waves of Wellness is a founding member of ISTO back in 2017 with seven other surf therapy charities. And it was such a special time for us to be able to connect with people in the sector who were sharing so much joy and good vibes. So fast forward to now in 2021, Chris Baracio is doing an amazing job of charging, leading the charge with ISTO. With how many, how many organizations is it now, Chris, that are a part of ISTO? I can't even remember the number. We'll get that in I'm, on, I'm on mute. 90. 90. Holy moly. All right. There you go. 90 different kinds of surf therapy organizations around the world doing epic things. And all of you guys are a part of that community as well. So this is in 2018, this photo where we actually started the surf therapy declaration, which was headed up by a number of us in the, um, in the, in the family. And uh, this is the declaration here, just to give you a quick snapshot. If you haven't seen this, it's on the website of Visto. It's all about the idea of lifting the bar of surf therapy across the sector. And you can see there in those three waves, understand, share and advocate around making sure that surf therapy is done in a safe, effective manner and can be, I guess, implemented in a really great way around the world. And we can support you in doing that. So if you're watching this and going, mm, I'd love to find out a bit more, you can reach out to us or to ISTO and find out more information. Alrighty, so how did we get here? This is a big question we often get. And as you can see here, the early days of, of my experience in the mental health sector and surfing was with OneWave. And uh, I helped Grant run, I helped Grant run OneWave for around four years. And it was an amazing experience where we had an amazing opportunity to engage with stacks of people all around the world. And we actually um, it had some pretty incredible experiences, actually. You might have seen this a couple of years ago in 2019 when Harry and Megan came to Australia. But it goes a bit back a bit earlier than this when I actually took one of my young guys surfing when I was working as an occupational therapist in a mental health setting. It was actually the first episode psychosis, early psychosis program in Bondi in Sydney. And uh, this guy said to me, what, what is it that I can do to get back to functioning? Like, I used to be a surfer. I, I wish I could. I put on 25 kilos due to, to medication, et cetera. And I, I said to him, mate, I can take you surfing if you like. And uh, it, truth be told, I would have had my um, head on the chopping blocks if they found out that I did that. But it was the most profound experience of my clinical career. It was 30 minutes out there floating with this guy and just having the best time. We didn't catch one wave. 
did not catch a wave. And it was just so phenomenal to see how much he let down his guard. He just relaxed and he was like a different person. And I would say that in those 30 minutes, we probably got more out of working together than we did probably in the, the last three months together in a clinical setting. And that to me showed me that this is something we have to do. And I didn't even know that surf therapy was a thing back then. And then that's, this is probably about nine years ago, eight or nine years ago. So yeah, there's, there's been a, a lot of progression in the sector since, and it's so exciting, but long story short, we decided that we have to do this. We tried to do it uh, and we did a pilot pilot program within one wave. It was so successful that we realized, holy moly, we have to start this. And then we have to like, create it into its own charitable giving because waves of wellness wasn't existing at that time we said well this is how we're going to take it's going to be the vehicle that we take this forward and make sure that we can create positive change for many more people over the years so he actually became a bit of a um, spotlight he was on national radio tv and this was the perfect example of what it's like when you lean into someone's strengths and focus on what they want to do and surfing as therapy for him was what it was all about waves of wellness was actually founded in 2016 but like we've talked about this has been going on for around about nine years and basically wow is all about delivering innovative programs that challenge the status quo around mental health and well-being and obviously we know a lot about the stigma we know a lot about the people not accessing support so this is really, really key for us to, to do a health by stealth. You might hear that comment a little bit today because health by stealth is what we are all about. It's giving people the clinical skills and the coping strategies to manage in their life, but actually they don't realize they're getting that impact. So we are mental health clinicians. We are a very clinical focused organization, which has what we call unicorns that are running the programs that are mental health trained clinicians in either psychology, occupational therapy, mental health, social work, or mental health nursing. And they are the, the people who are really leading the charge for us, but they are also learned to surf instructors. So you can imagine how hard it is to find a unicorn who is an intermediate surfer as well as a clinician, but it's a, it's a great recipe that we're really proud of. And uh, we, we are all about working with those community organizations to make that lasting impact. So the impact that we've created over the last, um, what are we at, five years this year with Waves of Wellness being registered, we've had 141 programs, we've had 1,500 people through our programs and 124 volunteers to date. And as you can see by the map there, I don't know how well you guys know Australia and the far south of the world, but we have rolling out, we are rolling out programs in 10 locations around four states this year. Those new colours you can see is where our operations are expanding this year. So lots of action, lots of exciting stuff going on, but it's about making sure that as we scale, as we grow, we do it sustainably. We, we do it efficiently and effectively rather than just trying to go too hard, too fast, which can be easily done if it's not thought out and there's a great strategy behind it. So I'm going to hand over to Marky Marks and he's going to drive, dive into the therapy side of things. Thanks for that, Joel. Um, I might just introduce myself quickly. So I'm seeing some familiar faces, some new faces. Um, so that you guys can understand the lens that I bring to Waves of Wellness. So I've been with WOW for the last four years as the um, program manager. I'm a mental health social worker um, and have really dove into seeing WOW from kind of the grassroots beginning, um, first facilitating programs with Joel in those very early, early days and now um, supporting our 12 facilitators across the country to actually deliver effective programs. Um, on a bit of a side note, this is actually, I'm actually wrapping up my time with Waves of Wellness and I'm going to be moving back into direct um, client work, but um, I'm really happy to share my experiences today on uh, what's been an incredible journey um, with WOW and hopefully uh, you guys can continue to um, take some of the learnings from today and implement it in the great work that you are doing um, around the world. So with Waves of Wellness, I'm going to start kind of really wide and then narrow the focus down into our actual group work. So just so you guys understand, we have two different, I guess, versions of programs. We have our six weeks, uh, which is our men's health group. It's called our Sand and Surf program. And that is really a prevention based um, group. What we're going to be focused on today is more of our eight week Waves of Wellness surfing experience, which is our clinical program. We can just go next slide. Now that eight week wait, uh, what we call the WOWC program, we work with 
believe we're up to now 15, 16 different type of WOWC groups. So we work with vulnerable populations across the spectrum, as you can see here, from general adult mental health programs to um, working with refugees, working in youth trauma, um, delivering uh, programs for veterans and first responders with PTSD group, or doing um, more youth groups with various schools. But what's important to understand is that at Waves of Wellness, we like to say there's a WOW program for anyone. So no matter where you sit on that spectrum of mental health, whether you're a fully functioning person working a hectic corporate job, um, you may qualify for our men's like sentence or prevention based program. Or if you're someone that struggled with mental health um, quite severely and maybe have a very severe and persistent mental um, mental health challenge, there's also a program for you. So we've adapted our WOWC model over the years to suit to various different demographics. And we've done that by working collaboratively with experts in those areas to ensure that our facilitators are trained and understand how they can best support this wide range of different types of programs. Um, our program, so as I mentioned before, it's an eight week course once a week for two hours. These are the range of different um, different program like weekly topics that we have each week. So as you can see here, it starts off quite generally in terms of group rules, gathering expectations, setting goals. Then we move into what is wellness and each as e each week progresses, we're building on that knowledge base or that psychoeducation. So we touch on everything from mindfulness to managing change to um, problem solving and over the years, we found that these topics are really translatable to any of those, you know, 15 different program types. All of these eight topics are really, really um, practical and very, uh, I guess, very like um, it suits all those demographics. And regardless of if you're a veteran or if you're a, a young person in high school, being able to understand how to better manage change is something that can really positively impact your mental health. Same with healthy relationships. So these topics are kind of suitable for across the board. Um, and as we move forward, we'll, we'll chat a little bit more about how we manage those, those group dynamics. So the wow factor is really all about, I guess, the, the motto or how we deliver and facilitate our wow program. So as Joel mentioned before, health by stealth is a motto that really underpins the work that we do because our facilitators are allied health trained. So they're, they might have a, a psychology, social work, occupational therapy, mental health nursing background, but they're also surf instructors. So we don't advertise come and do a waves wellness program and and do an eight-week therapy course we actually say come and learn how to surf in this eight-week program and at the same time you're going to learn about some really great skills to better manage your mental health so it's really that that tone and in, in challenging that stigma around getting support with your mental health is really really um, important and a big part of what we do because that really eliminates that kind of first step that a lot of people think, oh no, that's not me, like I don't need support. I don't need a therapy group, um, but learning to surf, hey, that sounds pretty cool. So when we do that, we do it in a way that um, promotes that, that fun and inclusivity um, using surfing. So that's how we really get that buy-in. Now, as I mentioned before, we have a community-based approach. What I mean by this is that we work with all kinds of different organizations in different communities to understand how we can best support the participants or clients that they have as part of the program. So if I use Veteran Sports Australia as an example, they work exclusively with veterans. Um, when we did a pilot program with them, we worked very collaboratively in saying, you, we know that you guys know this demographic and in, in this population really, really well. How can Waves of Wellness best support these clients in coming down to the program? Rather than kind of going and saying, this is our program, this is how it's structured, and this is what we talk about. It's really working with our partners to understand what are the needs, what are the things we need to be aware of, and how can we adapt what we do really well in providing safe and educational surf therapy programs to suit the needs of those, those demographics. So I would say, regardless of the, the programs or how your programs are structured, if you can have that collaborative approach, you can impact and help a lot of people.
That's a great shout, Mark. And we've just got an amazing question coming in from Holly Beck. And she said, I'm interested in hearing more about the health by stealth marketing strategy. I see that as a barrier of people who don't need the service, who do need the service, should I say, but don't think that they do. Now, that's a really interesting one. As we can see here that Mark's just talked through these, these organisations, there's a number across the top on the page. And there's a number here that are very more mental health specific or mental illness based, should I say. And there's some that are more veteran sports Australia. They're the kind of people who, are, you know, return servicemen and they don't see that they necessarily need the help. But the way that they can get support is huge. So the marketing strategy is very diverse across the 17 different platforms that we run. But it's also very tailored towards the style, the communication style and the approach that that demographic needs. Let's take veteran sports, for example, and say that, you know, come down, connect with people, get, you know, get that camaraderie back that you might be missing, connect with people who understand your journey, who've been through what you've been through and learn about how to, to manage your mental health while coming and surfing and making it all about the surfing side of things. And you're going to come and connect and hang. What They don't realize that they're going to get the clinical based therapy over the eight weeks, the different topics. They understand that once they get there to, to week one, but by us being able to do that in a slow way, Mark, another one might be our Movember program. How might we be able to promote that to those guys? Yeah, so it's really about like finding the right language, Holly. And it took us a little bit of trial and error to understand what that is. But we even use terms about like, come down, learn to surf and get real about your wellness or learn to surf and, and learn a little bit about wellness at the same time. So when people sign up, like the name in itself, Waves of Wellness, they understand there's going to be a wellness component. We just might not play so heavily on the fact that, you know, um, doing this therapy group or or you know um get treatment for your mental health that we don't that's not the that's not the i guess the messaging we want to have we want to have a balanced messaging around yeah we're going to learn how to surf but at the same time we're going to actually learn some skills that are going to help us just better manage in life yeah and the, the idea the second follow-up question that holly had is you aren't necessarily promoting it as surf therapy question mark and the answer is no we're not necessarily always saying surf therapy surf therapy but what we're noticing over the last five years is that term surf therapy is actually being much more strength-based positive orientated and that means that if you hear the word surf therapy it's not necessarily associated with i'm sick and i need therapy and so the, the, we're trying to move towards that, that angle of we have surf therapy in that, like the, the wording in big letters on all of our vans around the country. And we talk about it in a way that is very, very positive. So I think the way that people consider the traditional, you know, white sterile setting, that, that therapy setting is they're very different to the idea of surf therapy. And it's quite progressive. And I think that all of us around the world are speaking in that same dialogue. And it's really co it's collectively creating impact in the way that we want to move forward with that. Thanks for that question, Holly. That was really cool. She's giving snaps. I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. All right. So now this is the real nitty gritty of our groups. And this is a part of Waves of Wellness that I absolutely love. So our team of, of um, mental health facilitators over the last four years, we've learned a lot about running groups. And I know that within ISTO, there's such a wide range of surf therapy programs from programs that span for the, the course of a year to like one day programs. So I'm hopeful that um, regardless of the, t the structure and the type of programs that you guys are, are running, that some of the information you're going to learn here is going to be applicable. Um, and we're going to leave some time for questions at the end as well. Um, but with Waves of Wellness, because our groups, we have a group of 10 to 12 participants, and that runs for a span of eight weeks. Um, and whether you're doing a one day program, like there, I'm assuming most of us are doing group work and these group dynamics and managing some of these dynamics is going to be important. Even if you are doing a one day program, because you'll see some of the, these things and themes come up, um, throughout the day. So I don't know if anyone's ever heard of, um, Bruce Tuckman's like the, this, uh, forming, storming, um, monitoring, performing, adjuring groups, but these are five stages of. Um, that a lot of groups go through. And if you haven't heard of it, look it up. It's really interesting stuff. And I think that like at each of these five stages, our facilitators play a slightly different role as, as a facilitator. So for example, when a group is forming, maybe it's just the very first week, we practice a lot of really active facilitation. So it's important that our facilitators are outlining the boundaries of the group, what we're here to talk about, what we're 
what we can't really talk about and while we're together, um, what the kind of practical things around when we're going to meet, when we're going to go surfing, um, what the what the goals are of the participants. And that's a very active process as a group facilitator in those early, early days. Now, when you move more towards a storming phase, you might find that um, there is maybe some tension within the group. And as a facilitator, you might have to do some containment or some reframing and redirection and, and getting feedback from the group is really important. But at each of these stages, the role of a facilitator changes. And to add a different layer on top of that, every single group is different. So there really is not a cookie cutter training to becoming a good facilitator. It's really all about being able to be being adaptive, flexible, um, and just coming back to what is my purpose here facilitating this group? And that's to provide a safe and inclusive environment. And along the way, I wanna be able to facilitate discussion that's gonna promote learning and skill building, but I need to make sure that those parameters are built. The idea of the boundaries is a really key one, hey, Mark, because like we'll, we'll often see people get down to the program and they'll say, like, like what can we expect here? And it, it's the strength in facilitation that really creates that safe space to allow them to understand exactly what they're in for, what they can expect and what they're able to share and what they can get support for but what you'll find is that when things start to unravel it's when you haven't set clear boundaries it's when you haven't set the group rules where people don't realize what they're able to and not able to do and then they'll start to really push the boundaries especially in our youth trauma programs these guys have been through a lot they've seen so much stuff they've experienced more trauma than we would have would hope to see in our lifetime they haven't even hit the age of 13 yet and so for them, they're, they're dealing with so much complex emotions that they often act out in the group. And it's wonderful to be able to pull back into, hey, guys, remember how we had that conversation around what our expectations are in the group? And remember how you guys all said, yeah, you agreed to, yeah, we can do this. And we all agreed together. We're going to up, uphold these values. So maybe let's talk about a few of those boundaries, Mark. What, what, what are the sorts of things in the group rules that we might start to establish in week one? Yeah, so I around boundaries and safety, like this this is probably the, the most important part of the group is that first interaction you have with the participants because you're gonna be able to explain to them that, look, so you know we all come down to the group with our all, we all have our own unique experiences and we might all be here because we've gone through some type of trauma. And this group is gonna be a safe space where we can discuss this openly and talk about healthy coping strategies that we might use and learn from each other and, and have some reflection. But it's important that when we are together, we're not actually diving into the details of the trauma that we've experienced. Or one thing that comes up quite frequently in our programs because we are working with vulnerable people is discussing, talking about suicide and understanding that suicide is a very, um, it's a harsh reality of working people that are working with people that are struggling with their mental health. And our facilitators have learned how to navigate these conversations safely. So the way we approach that one around suicide would be validating that person's experience. So if they're, if they're sharing something or disclosing this to a, a group, really validating and listening and saying, look, this, it sounds like it is a really, really hard time for you. And suicide is something that's very real. And we don't want to shy away from that. But when it comes to actual safety planning and um, understanding your unique situation to make sure you're going to be safe, it's important that you do that one-on-one -on -one with the mental health professional. So let's touch base a little bit uh, after the group and I can link you up or, or make sure that you're connected with someone that can really walk you through that. So learning how to navigate these discussions are important, but what's gonna help you even more as a facilitator is on week one, make sure that you're laying out these group rules and you're including participants and, and encouraging them to state, you know, what are the rules they would like to see? What do they need from the group to make sure that they're gonna feel safe while they're here? Um, what are the goals they have for the program and what are some things that they're hoping to achieve? And when you do that together with the group, you start to get that forming um, and you develop a bit of group norms with the group so they understand, okay, cool, this is a time where I can come down here, I can be open and real, but I'm not going to dive into the details of, of my own past, past history. Or if I've, I'm feeling the urge to do that, I can flag that with Mark and he can kind of connect me um, with someone that can really help me with that. So boundaries are so, so important. And, and just like we set boundaries when we're going out into the surf saying, look, this is a zone where we want to be surfing and want to stay on the sandbank. We don't want to get too close to the rip. We do the same thing when we're setting up a group. So that's something that's really, really important. Um, 
also trauma-informed care. And, and this is a, a massive, massive area of learning uh, for us is that when you're working with someone that has experienced trauma, things like touching in the water, um, often, you know, when we're supporting someone in learning to surf, we're pretty physical with them. Like we might need to grab them, get them out of a dangerous situation, give them a push. From a, a trauma-informed approach to that would be week one, we show them um, exactly how we might need to handle them in the water. And we give them as much information as possible. And information is gonna be really, really important. I mean, the two things with trauma, information and choice is gonna really help reduce that anxiety around. If you are uncomfortable with this, please let us know, just flag it with us and we can kind of adjust how we would work together. But also it's important that you guys understand that we have a duty of care to keep you safe out in the ocean. So sometimes we might be quite direct and grab you and push you in this direction or whatever it is, but we want you to know that we're doing that so that you, we can ensure that you're gonna be safe. So giving yeah. them that logic and reasoning behind that. Yeah, absolutely. Amen to that, Mark. And I think it's really important to note that if someone is experiencing these sorts of, um, I guess, emotions and, and experiences with their mental health, then it's not about saying we're going surfing because often they're going to compare themselves to other group members and, and almost have that negative self-talk of I'm not at their level and I'm not as good as they are. So often we will say, let's leave the surfboards on the sand, guys, on week one. Let's all get together and let's go and go for a swim in the flags or go down by the shore and let's just slowly get ourselves into the water. Let's understand what it's like to get ahead underwater maybe for the first time that idea of getting pummeled by the waves at your waist is a lot more comfortable without having a board pulling you back under so there's there's definitely a graded approach and we call it a graded exposure in therapy and it's about being able to ensure that people feel safe where they're at and we're meeting them where they are at while, rather than saying you've got to come and be at our level that we're expecting you to be. Now, a couple of great questions there. One from Dave being how many groups, uh, how many people do we have in our groups? We have 10 participants. We usually recruit to 12 or 13 and allow for some dropout. But then we have um, two to three volunteers and two facilitators. So there's roughly about 15 people on the sand at one time. We will always have our 30 minute expression session or what we call our, our circle discussion. Um, it's sort of taking that, that play on the, the surfing competition around going out and having an expression session, winning your cash sort of thing. Then we have, after that 30 minute conversation where we have the eight weeks, the eight different mental health topics, we then sort of turn into a five minute, you no know, theoretical component of the surfing aspect, really talking through the, the considerations around your mental health and surfing and making sure that they're not, um, I guess a, a surfing instructor can really say, all right, here's the surfboard, let's go surfing, let's get out there. And that is just not how we need to establish our, our programs. And every one of you guys will need to consider this in some setting or some scenario that there are going to be people that feel completely overwhelmed. Someone who has anxiety will need you to coach through every part of the process. So simply remember, it's not about just throwing them in. It's about being able to work with them and where they're at. The other question or the comment that we had from Chris around is some people might feel more comfortable around a female instructor rather than a male. They might have had, uh, we've actually got domestic violence programs with women only and they're run by men. And we absolutely understand that bias and that discomfort, but we don't shy away from that. We name it. We say, ladies, we, we understand that this is uncomfortable and we understand that we don't have um, mental health trained surfing facilitators that are female in Sydney. But the way that we make up for that is we actually bring our really, tr our really trusted and amazing female volunteers that are actually one of them is a trained surfing instructor and the other one's like a, a clinician herself. And they come along and get involved. And the volunteers can play such a pivotal role in these programs in bridging that client therapist relationship. And that's very clinical language, right? And we would never name that in our, in our programs. But we've got our participant and we've got our therapist purpose and they do not necessarily feel comfortable coming and being in that relationship so the middle ground is the volunteer who will really bridge that gap and form that bond with them and connect over the duration of the eight-week program yeah great point chris um and the the other thing here with group dynamics like there's some really key skills that we we train our facilitators to get really good at and that, that some of them that come to mind validation summarization containment and redirection so anyone that's had some experience with with group work like it's it's not an easy task right you have 10 people coming here together and it's your job to facilitate kind of a a a discussion that's going to be um that's going to allow everyone to feel like they have a voice in the group um that's going to validate their experience but also provide an opportunity for some some learning and skill building so one of the biggest skills as a facilitator is being able to know what to do in that situation where maybe you have a participant that's oversharing 
or maybe they're um, really kind of going on about their own very individualized experience or something that they've had a hard time with. And I think like 50% of facilitation is being able to validate that person's experience, take some key points out of their own experience in relating that to the group. And saying, you know what, Joel, I'm hearing that this is a really hard time for you. Or I'm, I'm hearing that you're having some challenges in, in your relationship with your partner or whatever it is. Is there anyone else in the group that's gone through something similar to Joel? And what kind of strategies have, have, has the group used to manage that? And being able to do that skillfully in a way that validates Joel's experience, you might do a bit of summarization, package that up, and then... Um, kind of reframe it to the group as an open-ended question, then allows for other voices to come into the conversation. And you can really start to get that great learning and normalization of some mental health challenges that people would experience. And that's a real bread and butter of group work. And I'm sure if you guys are doing day programs or whatever it is, that's a skill that, that you, you can use as well in terms of creating a bit of a, a, a shared struggle in a group or a, a, a summarization of the skills learned. Another thing that's really valuable here to note is that when we have a, a, a Mark just spoke about me as a participant, right? And as how are you going? Let's expand. Let's package up your your story and and use that as a tool to help other people feel like they can connect with your story. Now we've got participants sharing their own experiences. We've got volunteers sharing their own experiences. But the big part of what we do at Wow is storytelling and lived experience. And lived experience doesn't necessarily have to be that, that very traditional way of if you are a mental health clinician, you cannot speak about your mental health experience because we normalize this so much so at WOW, we're breaking down that stigma by saying that we all go through shit in our lives. Let's talk about it. Let's normalize it and understand that we are far less different than we thought we were. Or should I say we're much more similar with each other than we think we are. So what we will do as clinicians is we will actually say, like, hey, like this is my experience and I will share my own personal lived experience of, of suicidality at the age of 13. I will share the ups and downs of burnout and anxiety and having family members with suicidality. Like this is not something that we shy away from having conversations about. It's important that you set up a trigger warning. It's important that you tell people that, yeah, these conversations are going to be built up over time. We don't just go zero to hero. But once we share and once we are the storyteller about our own lived experience, you will be incredibly amazed at what takes place after that. There are so many amazing stories of our facilitators really setting up a safe space where people are sharing, I've had a miscarriage 12 weeks ago and I haven't shared it with anyone. I was suicidal last week and this program is actually what saved my life. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have waves of wellness. There's testimonials, which we're going to dive into shortly, but this is all about setting up that safe space and using yourself as a tool to help these people understand that they're so much more similar than they think to you. Thanks, Joel. And we got a question from Afro about, can you speak to empowerment, um, how and what you facilitate um, skills that enable people to continue this post program? So great question. And that kind of speaks to the, the next um, point here around skill building and what we actually do at Waves of Wellness. So from, you know, week one to week eight, we're preparing these participants that, look, this is a, a program that goes for eight weeks, but we want to give you skills that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So from, you know, week, it's week four, we usually look at doing a mindfulness activity. And we are explaining to participants each week that, yes, these are skills that we're going to talk about once a week when we get together. Um, but we very much feel that for you guys to get the most out of this program, these are things that you should be practicing beyond this group together. So each week we're going to be encouraging you to practice certain things or look out for red flags that come up for you over the next seven days. And then let's regroup and talk about that. So every single week, we're hoping that people are taking these skills and trying it outside of group so that it starts to form that habit. We're also giving them the experience to to say, let's look at, talk about mindfulness specifically. Mindfulness is a reoccurring skill that we, we work on with the group. And one of the weeks we actually build a, what we call a mindfulness raft. So we stack all the surfboards, we take it out the back. We have all the participants lay down on their backs in the middle of the ocean, past the breaking waves. And our facilitators in the middle, walking them through a 10 minute guided mindfulness exercise. Now we use that space to normalize that mindfulness maybe isn't for everyone, Mindfulness can be pretty freaking hard if you're new to it, but we have such a unique environment out in the ocean that is so conducive to a positive experience because you have 
all of your senses being engaged. You can feel the coldness of the water. You can taste the salt. You can hear the birds. And we use this as a platform to just explain to the group, this is just the beginning. Like this is one example of how you can practice mindfulness and we can do it in this great environment. But the real bread and butter is gonna be if you can remind yourself to do this at work when you're feeling really anxious. If you can remind yourself to practice mindfulness when you're feeling overwhelmed at home or, or whatever it is. So we encourage them to get a taste tester at the program of these skills, but that it's hopefully something they can continue, continue beyond the group. Yeah, and the best way we can do that is using our mental health toolkit. So we often call it your mental health toolbox or your mental health toolkit. And we want you to bring that down to the group, open it up, and whatever you hear as being those awesome things that you might be able to do to manage your mental health, then we've just heard that mindfulness meditation exercise of a floating meditation. It's so powerful. But pick that up, put in your toolbox, close it up, and whenever things don't go to plan, maybe you can utilize that in the future. Now, Afro, a big part of your question was post-program. What about post-program follow-up? Now, we are not about just, you know, having this program and then just dropping away because that's just not sustainable. So having a WOW alumni, and this speaks a bit to Becca's point as well around Facebook and social media, we are setting these guys up with the skills and the ability and the knowledge and awareness to actually continue surfing. We're giving them discounted products with our partners, our community partners around wet surfboards and wetsuits. We're also giving them discounted surfing lessons with our partners, but also we are looking at like regular surf meetups once a month to make sure that these guys actually can come and continue that skill. Now, the alumni on Facebook is really interesting because it's been a bit of a tough one over the last five years working out what the balance is and we don't want to set up individual ones for every site around Australia we've actually got an Australian alumni and then people can have a WhatsApp group with their specific group members if they all consent to the sharing of data and that will be something led by them rather than us but it's definitely something that we're playing with and working through because we want to make sure that these guys can carry on and not be dependent on WOW and I think that that upskilling and that independence is such a powerful part of that empowerment so thanks a bunch for those questions all right. That's awesome, Guy. I, in light of time here, we're going to move on to, to the next slide. We I wanted to speak a little bit about activities with youth. In a nutshell, we have a, a, a manual of different activities that we actually run through with youth, and I'm sure um, we'd be happy to share that if you, if you guys are looking for, for various ideas. Um, so in summary, like, I'm going to pass it over to Joel now because it is um, we only have about 20 minutes and we want to live, leave time for, for, for questions. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions at the end, I'm happy to, to chat to those. Well done, Mark. That's really cool. And what I think is really powerful is that you guys are asking questions throughout. So while we, we might have a little less time for questions at the end, we've answered already about three or five questions that, that are unreal that you guys are asking. So keep them coming. We've got another one from Clara that says, is there somewhere where I can find more information about mindfulness and meditation in the ocean? Um, in, in terms of what we offer, we don't have anything documented, but we can certainly share some information with you if you like. So just reach out and get in touch. So we talked about testimonials just earlier, and I won't spend too much time on this. It's just around sharing with you some of the experiences that we've seen in our program. Now, this is Jen. She's a 12-year-old who came through our youth trauma program, and she's one of those people who I was saying has been through far too much in her life, and she's only 12 years old. Now, she found out that um, her mother was, you know, I guess, died by self-harm, and she was self-harming herself when she found this out. And this is a very triggering story, but it's also an extremely powerful one where she said, well, that might happen to me, and I need to rethink my strategy here so it's it's just so phenomenal what these people have had to experience but for us to be able to be the pivot point and the turning point in their lives to get them back on the train tracks of life we're so excited to be able to do that on a, on a weekly basis this is Matthew he's 24 years old he was he's OG waves of wellness like he came about in the very early days and I always pull back to this one because I love his story he has schizophrenia and he has quite complex mental health mental ill health and um, he, he said that the, when I come here, it's the, the only two hours in my week that I don't have to rehearse every single thing I'm going to say. It's the only two hours that I don't hear those voices in my head. Now, for someone with schizophrenia, working in early psychosis and sort of specialising in that mental health field in my career of OT, that really highlighted the importance of this. It was being in flow. It was being in a connected space. It was not being at home, isolated, playing video games the whole week with rumination thoughts, with the, the delusions, the persecutory, persecutory delusions. <clears throat> 
I'm struggling to talk, guys. I'll, I'll get there. Um, but I, I think this is one of those perfect examples of like those people come from all walks of life to our programs all around the world to all of you. And we can set up an amazing opportunity for them to feel like they are a valuable member of our community. And that is what humans are all about, is connecting and feeling like they belong. All righty. So over to Phil. Now, just to give you a bit of a snapshot on Phil, he won't talk very um, very much about big noting himself, but this man is the chairman of Waves of Wellness. He's been a director for the last three years. He is an absolute guru around mental health and wellbeing. He's a professor of schizophrenia research, and we are so glad to have Phil, a massive part of the WOW family, and to be leading the charge. He's been a big part of ISTO from the day dot over in um, Johannes, uh, was the Cape Town in 2017. He was a founding member of ISTO. So he's basically the godfather of surf therapy. And uh, without further ado, please meet Professor Philip Ward. Oh, what a, what a great uh, intro. Thanks a lot, Joel. And uh, yeah, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and to talk about uh, you know, what rocks my boat, which is actually collecting the data that actually allows us to demonstrate that, that the WOW pro programs are effective and how they're effective in, in actually improving the lives of, of, of the participants who come through. And I guess it's really been, you know, from the very beginning, data collection has been something that's been a, a focus. I remember the very first program that, uh, that Joel ran as under the waves of wellness uh, uh, under the one wave banner was actually, you know, we were, in, we were collecting data there and also trying to, to balance getting quantitative data that is getting scales and measures that that allow us to to um to quantify um the outcomes but also getting the um qualitative data you know getting those testimonials and then being able to analyze that data in a way that enables us to to get a better understanding of what are the key features of of the program that are actually having the impact uh in terms of improving people's outcomes and making them feel better so uh we i know that jamie marshall is on the call and uh, and he's actually you know the first person in the world who's doing their uh, phd on surf therapy and i'm one of his supervisors externally he he's based at uh, edinburgh napier university in scotland but jamie it came out a couple of years ago and and uh, did a grounded theory exploration of of the waves of wellness programs and this is going to be part of his uh, his phd thesis he's also worked with um, the veterans program in california and also with um, a great program in in uh, West Africa in Liberia as well. Um, and those, um, those papers have already been published. His work on WOW is going to go into his thesis, but it's actually going to, uh, to be uh, published you know, as, as well in, in due course. Uh, we also have, um, so, so what, what did Jamie find you know, in, in his paper? I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you the chapter and verse of that in, in the few minutes, but safe space, social support, respite, and sensory grounding were the key themes. And if, if you think about what Mark and, and Joel have just been talking about, that's actually the intention. That that's the, Those are the, the features that we've tried to build into the, to the WOW programs. And indeed, that's what the participants are telling us back are the things that really make the program effective for them. So I think that's a great validation of the, of the process that, that in fact, we are getting to um to to have an impact in the way that we want uh, in a way that uh, is actually meaningful for the participants so that when they're interviewed after the program they're actually feeding back that these are the key elements to them that lead to the positive outcomes that they have from being uh, uh, taking part in the wow programs um it's it's very clear that isto has got a great commitment to research and evaluation as well and you know under the isto banner we were able to have a special issue of the global Journal of Community Psychology last year, all about surf therapy. Uh, Gregor Sarkassian from, uh, from Antioch University, um, Krista Mulder from San Diego, uh, uh, Giovanni from Puerto Rico, and, my, and, and myself were the editors of this. And it's a great resource. So if you haven't seen it, it's freely available um, online, open access. And it really gives a, 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 an idea of the breadth of the uh, uh, of the um, of the work that's being done in terms of 
the evidence for surf therapy right around the world. Um, we've also had uh, a, a clinical psychologist, Rebecca McKenzie, who did a, um, a, a project with us uh, uh, based on our Northern Beaches um, uh, program. And that's actually just been submitted to, uh, to a journal for publication. Again, you know, trying, you know, getting at, at what is really um, the key elements that makes a difference to these, to these clinical programs. Uh, one of the exciting things that's coming up in the future is actually trying to get even stronger evidence about the under, underlying uh, biological correlates of what we're doing. So we, we understand that, that people are feeling better, that their, that their psychological uh, well-being is, is improved, but we're going to be able to do a study uh, later this year um, with the, uh, the Thompson Institute based at the University of the Sunshine Coast in, uh, in Queensland. Uh, and we're going to be able to do brain scans, MRI brain scans, pre and post uh, a program focused on on people suffering from PTSD and you know it'll be fascinating to see what impacts there are in terms of brain structure and function from participating in, in one of the the waves of wellness uh, uh, programs so th there's a lot more work that needs to be done here and it's all about gaining this gathering this evidence to further um, support for implementing these programs as part of our um, as, as part of the uh, uh, a regular you know, routine treatment. So we wanna move into a world where, you know, you have your psychotherapist and, and you have your psychiatrist and you have your surf therapist. And actually they're all just people who are there to support you through a mental health journey and to give you the tools that you need to actually um, live your very best life. So I think I'll hand back to Joel. Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. The only other thing that we wanted to mention here, and thanks, Phil, it's so great to have your input and, and the, the contacts, the, the connections and the expertise in the, in the mental health industry, I think is something where if you guys don't have that, what Phil has been able to demonstrate as a case study here is that connection with the local university is powerful. It is really powerful. University of New South Wales is in Sydney. It's only about eight kilometres from the beach and they have been really supportive. Phil has been really supportive in making this dream come to life. So the, the, the only thing that we need to, to talk about here in, in referencing back to the ISTO declaration, the surf therapy declaration that we built together at ISTO, is that we are justifying the, the efficacy of surf therapy. That also comes with it a justification of funding, but it also talks about lev up, leveling up and raising that bar of surf therapy across the sector. And um, with, with the introduction of a new technology platform called Salesforce at Waves of Wellness, we're about to go live and press the green light on that. And that's going to change the way that we do things. The Movember Foundation are a supporter of Waves of Wellness and they have actually funded that and said that we understand that this needs to be a lot more efficient if it's going to move forward and, and help more people. So we can share more with the ISTO family about Salesforce and how that's changing the game for us when things sort of progress as we get on with that, if you like. All right, thanks very much, Phil. So just to, to speak about that research side of things that Phil mentioned is that once we did that, and once we, these are particularly qualitative, um, I guess, testimonials, the feedback we were receiving from participants was so phenomenal, but it was also reassuring and also great for us to pivot and address the needs that they had. So there are a lot of great things that were constructive feedback, if you will. And I can assure you guys, as surf therapy enthusiasts, there is no such thing as negative feedback. It's always a way to pivot, to change, to be better and to strive for better. So I'm not going to go into all the detail of all these testimonials, but there is some really special stuff that we were hearing from our participants. In particular, I just will highlight one of them. I said that uh, like I wouldn't do this, but the, the, the bottom right, men in general, yes, we don't talk about things. Yeah, everything is kind of under wraps. So this brings to life and allows us to have an honest conversation. Now that honesty piece is something that every man needs and deserves and often doesn't have the canvas to do that. They might not have the supportive friends or the community or the even types of connections that allow them to open up. And we know in Australia that men are the six of the eight suicides that happen per day. So it's three quarters of the population of suicides are men because they don't feel like they can talk about this stuff. So like Mark said, there is no surf therapy program that isn't appropriate for every person in the world. And our programs are, I guess, addressing the needs of everyone, but they're doing it on a spectrum from zero to 100. Every human falls into that spectrum at some point and we will meet them where they're at on that journey. 
So if we talk about looking ahead and what are we seeing with Waves of Wellness as the priority in the future, we just talked about Salesforce. We talked about the idea of scaling our programs efficiently and sustainably. It's about for us making sure that we can get to those populations of people around Australia that are actually calling out for us and saying, can you please come here? Can you please come and support our community? Because we've got a really big problem with suicide and we've got a lot of complex mental ill health issues. So we want to make sure that we can do that in, in an effective manner. And it's around using our hub and hybrid model, which we can share more with you about if you're interested later on. But, but for us, it's not necessarily about going as far as we can, as quick as we can, like we talked about earlier, because that is going to be the worst use of resources if it's done wrong. Last week, we had an amazing opportunity to almost continue our pivot into an emergency response program. Last year, there was a shark attack on the you know, mid-north coast of New South Wales, which was fatal to a 16-year-old boy named Marnie. And he had an amazing community of people who actually struggled and reeled in the, the death of his, of his life. So basically, we had 20 people in two programs up the north coast where the school contacted us and said, can we run a program for these guys focused on grief, loss, and trauma? Half of these guys were actually on the beach. It was school holidays and they saw the attack take place in the morning. The blood, the tourniquet, the zipping up of the body bag, like this stuff is very, very traumatic. And for them to not necessarily feel like they had the permission to get back in the ocean back then was one thing, but now to be one year later and be called back and say, hey, we want you to come back and do this again. I was fortunate enough to head up the coast and do that last week. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my surf therapy career to date. And so we're talking about here about looking ahead. We want to keep on lifting the bar and almost pushing ourselves to be innovative and support those communities of people who need that help. We also went to Malakuta, which was on the south coast of New South Wales, or Victoria, should I say, when we had those wild bushfires at the start of 2020. You guys might remember that around the world. It was all over the news. And there were people on the beach that feared for their safety. Now, that was another example of the, the Board Riders Club knew who, what we were all about. They knew who we were and they said, can you please come? And so in four weeks, we brought eight clinicians and ran a five-day intensive community program focused around trauma. And we were actually giving therapy to the therapists in the community community. Now, these are only two examples of, of how we've been able to pivot and use our clinical expertise in surf therapy to then help people in really difficult situations. But that's what we see the future of WOW looking like, being, you know, making sure that we can meet people where they're at, supporting the needs of, of vulnerable people, and just ensuring that we can help all of you guys in the WOW family and the ISTO family to lift the bar and help you guys to, uh, this stuff is not secret. This stuff is not something that we're holding close to our chest. That's why we're bearing all for you guys on this call because we are not about holding our, our, our cards close to our chest. We want to share all bravely like all of you do with Inisto so that we can help everyone do what we're doing in Australia or maybe learn from you guys how we can do things better as well. So we're really stoked to be here, guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's, it's unreal to have the chance to catch up with you. And I just want to reiterate that we are making waves together. We are doing this together and across the world. We the 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 whole, I guess, mission of ISTO is go far, go together, right? And that is what we're doing together. And we're so grateful to be part of this global community. Thank you so much for this. We're gonna we wrapped up early deliberately so that we can answer some of your really rich questions. Uh, but yeah, guys, really stoked on on making much, much more waves with you guys in the future. All righty, so question time. Let's roll on into the, the questions that we've got. Um, we've, we've got Lauren saying, I've been a surf therapy participant and volunteer and I want to do this professionally. If anyone on this chat, this is a call out to all of you guys. If anyone on this chat is open to connecting and chatting about the surf therapy path, send me a message. Lauren, you can reach out via the um, handle there on the screen or info at Foundation Wow. You can reach us and you can give us a shout. We're more than happy to, to talk you through the process. Um, I'm mindful that there's lots of different conversations taking place within ISTO, within the working groups that Chris has done a great job of establishing. So keep in touch with that as well. I think that there's these, these conversations in silos are not as valuable as the, the group scenarios where get involved and chat to Chris about the best group that you can be a part of. All righty. So what other questions do you guys have? There's lots of good vibes coming in. Um, Jamie said, have we got any insights around uh, the delivery of surf therapy in a wave pool setting compared to the beach? 
Great question. A wonderful question. One that we're really passionate about. We run a program out of Urban Surf Wave Pool in Tullamarine, Melbourne, which is in Victoria on the south end of Australia. This is an amazing opportunity. And Carmela's on the call, actually, who's our, our, our family member from down there who runs a great show. And it's it's something that we want to research. We want to do a comparison, I guess, case control study on a, an ocean-based versus pool-based program. We haven't had the ability to do that. We had to pull Kinland, actually, with COVID that took place and cancelled all programs. But it's something that we're really stoked to do. So if you want to chat more about that, Jamie, and how we might bring that to life, we'd be really excited to loop you back in. All right. So looking forward to how. All right. So any more questions you guys have? Do you get um, subvention from government? Subvention? Do we get the support from the government? Um, yes, we do. We, we have our first government support of a quarter of a million dollars last year, and that was a three, uh, two-year grant. Um, so that is um, going towards our surfing experience programs, which are the sort of other side of the operation in comparison to our Movember men's health programs, which are targeting men um, and their support systems. Any other questions that you guys have? I want you to fire away now and feel free to take yourself off mute and, and share some good vibes or ask your question in person as well. More than happy for you to do that. I'm just reading through this chat as we go through. And um, yeah, Mark, Phil, have I missed any questions here? Can you say more about the sensory orientation that you mentioned? Yeah, um, thanks, Lauren. I would say if there's lots of different ways you can go about mindfulness and every one of our facilitators goes about it a little bit differently. When I facilitate it, I like to just hone into the sensory. So when we're actually talking to them through a guided mindfulness activity, whether it's on the sand or out on that raft that we talked about, it's tuning into, a lot of you maybe have know of the five, four, three, two, one exercise. Five, well, I like to do five things you can see four things you can hear, three things you can feel, two things you can um, smell, and one thing you can taste. And that's just a quick little exercise to like get um, into the present moment and, and tune into the, the, the sensory. And it's all about not thinking too much about the future and not ruminating too much about the past, just being, being present. That's the 30, the 30 second summary. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, totally. That, that, I love that one. And what's really special about the floating meditation in particular is that you never get the opportunity to meditate while floating, unless you're in a, a salt float tank or something like that. So for us to have one facilitator sort of standing above everyone and having this almost this wise voice coming from above while everyone's just cruising on their back with their legs floating out in the water and what the other facilitator with the leg rope sort of towing the group around and making sure that they don't go into danger on the rocks or the, the, um, the waves, for example, it's just incredible to see and be a part of. And the other thing is a progressive muscle relaxation by, by naming and identifying that muscle and then a, like sending your energy there to relax that piece of your body. Um, there's also lots of really interesting um, stimuli at the beach that you can you know, allude to the, the noises of the seagulls or the waves crashing or the, the lapping of this, the beach or the kids playing in the sand. So there's lots of great things. My favorite one is actually a smiling meditation where you take someone on a journey and think back to a time in your life where you were really happy and really, really joyous. And then you start talking about the, what did that smell like, taste like, feel like, who did you share that with? Allow your smile to go across your face that ever so slightly and then grow that smile. And by the end of the five minutes, people are actually like grinning and just so joyous about that, that memory. And it's about bringing that experience back into the positive day in the current day and, and share that positivity day to day. All righty. So we, we heard from Holly. What about the crowds at the beach or in the water? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Bondi Beach is one of the busiest beaches in the world, and it's one kilometre stretch of sand. There's Sometimes there's 20 to 30,000 people down there, and we don't run in January, uh, December or January. And that's the school holidays. It's when the beach is really full. It's when the surf schools are also really jammed, and so we don't want to compete for, for I guess, real estate on the sand. So we want to, and our programs are also not necessarily, you wouldn't believe it, right? Bondi is jam-packed from around... 6 till 8 a.m. And then after that, it slows down because everyone goes to work. And so we have our sort of more mental ill health programs in the middle of the day, and it's not as hard to compete for real estate. But it's also important that we acknowledge that this is not something we need to hide or shy away from mainstream society. It's just that if we're having very confidential and complex discussions around mental ill health, we want to do that in a way that it is safe and confidential. And, and we have at least around 20 metres from other people and on the beach. 
All righty. Any other questions? Anyone want to speak out and, and ask anything in particular? I can see Shandon there. She's really stoked. She's about to jump into a 10.30 call on uh, on all things around surf therapy and trauma with a case study coming in from Erin. I think it is from Waves for Women. So, uh, yeah, thanks for leading the charge on that on that focus group. And it's really cool. Um, I think one of the, the other things that we need to consider, guys, is if you're not a part of these working groups, if you're not um, re- clicked in or registered with the, I guess, the the group that is most relevant to the population that you serve, then reach out to Chris, CEO of Visto, and she'll be able to line you up with the right person who's going to really help drive that and, and give you guys so much value. That question that we had from Clara, I think it was, um, no, maybe it was someone else who asked them, um, you know, how can we find out more information about getting involved? That's going to be your biggest um, value add to get involved in those groups. So I want to ask you a question to Phil. What, is, what has been your, your biggest eye-opening moment over the last eight years of being involved in surf therapy? What's one of those experiences where you just went, oh my God, like this is, this is it. This is what we have to do more of. Thanks, Joel. Look, I, I remember one of the early groups, which we were working with the homeless people. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a woman who was actually living on the streets in sort of back towards the center of the, the city. Um, so quite some way from Bondi. And she had to catch a bus down to, uh, to, to the beach to actually be, you know, to, to, to participate in, in the program. And look, it was so important to her. I, I, I did a bit of debriefing at the end of, uh, end of that uh, group. And, uh, and she was just saying, look, yeah, it's tough on the streets. It's really tough being a homeless person and, and you know, trying, to, trying to keep my stuff together and, and so forth is, is really challenging. But look, I will always come down for my surf therapy program because it is the, it's the one thing that's really keeping me going through this, uh, through this tough time that, that I'm having. And you know, it was just that determination, that drive to, you know, there was just no question of the value of this program to that, to that woman, because, you know, she was just putting everything in, into, into getting there and having that wonderful experience on the beach every week. She also um, struggled to even afford the bus ticket to get there, which was quite quite powerful in itself she would she would beg borrow and steal and just make sure that in any way possible she would get there for that session every week yeah mm. amazing really cool the other thing, uh, thing that I didn't answer part of Holly's question was what about the crowds in the water? Now, dropping in as surfers is obviously pretty important not to do and not to put our participants in danger. We've also got wave conditions where we don't want to be taking people out in a dumping shore break or out the back when they don't have the ability to, to really be confident out there. So what I would suggest is that, well, an easiest way to do it is take 15 people straight out in the lineup and then you piss a few people off and they get out of there. <laughs> but we don't want to do that. We're not about being uh, anti-surf folk. So we make sure that people are really aware of who and what we are. We, we make sure that we are, have really important conversations with them out in the water. Hey, guys, we've got a few people that are learning how to surf. If you, if you don't mind, if it's okay, if you just pop down the beach a little bit, that'd be great. The lifeguards, we've got a great relationship with them as well. But also a, a half of the beach at Bondi is for softboards only, which is really cool. Um, but regardless of where you're at, regardless of how crowded the lineup is, giving people the awareness of, of surf education, of not dropping in. We also use the, the framing of, Mark, this is something I want you to share with everyone. The, the idea of dropping in both physically and mentally. Yeah, so at Waves of Wellness, we love using metaphors and, and it's a really great way to communicate different concepts to people, whether it's around your mental health or just a rule in the group. We like to say week one when we're outlining rules, out in the surf, the first thing we want to learn about is like no dropping in. It's a very important rule because you're going to piss off a lot of people. But in at Waves of Wellness, when we're chatting in our expression session, when we're, we're, we're in group, we also don't want to drop in. So if someone's sharing something, we want to make sure we give them the space to do that without interrupting them. So everyone seems to really like that, whether it's like we're working with youth groups or adults. And when someone actually does cut someone off in the group, everyone calls out like, oh, no, 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 you can't drop in, no dropping in. So it's a little analogy that, that we use that works pretty well. Those metaphors are uh, one of the things which uh, we love the most about WOW is that we have probably a list of about 15 or 20 metaphors and we might just rattle off a couple of, with you just so you can understand the, the, the power of those to wrap up this call. My One of my favourite ones is someone actually brought this up as a participant in our group and she said sometimes 
the waves of the ocean are kind of like the waves of my emotions and it's it's really hard to get out the back sometimes and the waves just keep on coming at you and you just have to keep going otherwise you, you get knocked back onto the beach but at the end of the day like there's gonna be a lull and there's gonna be an opportunity for you to get back on your feet and just keep going and once you get out the back it's the stillness and the calmness and the almost the sense of pride that I just did that and I'm really stoked with myself so that's one example what's another one that you've got Mark? um metaphors we have um problem solving we, to communicate the idea of problem solving we compare that to managing rips and we actually will explain rips on the sand and talk about how you know sometimes if we're we we might be stuck in a rip and we're just paddling really hard against it how is that relatable to just trying to fight a problem you know maybe you need to practice some radical acceptance and actually if there's things outside of your control just accept that go with the flow float out the back and then reassess the situation later on. Or sometimes you might have to do is really, really hard and put your hand up and be like, I don't have the skills to get out of this rip. Like I don't have this, the swimming ability to actually manage this. I need the lifeguard to come and help me. And that can be really hard to do because you think, oh, what are people gonna think? They're gonna look at me. Well, it's kind of the same with your mental health. Like if you don't have the skills to, to manage and you're in a rough time, sometimes you need to get some help. Sometimes you need to see a psychologist. You need to, you know, talk to your GP about that and get some professional help. And that's okay. You're just learning those skills. So there's lots of kind of metaphors and analogies that we use. We got a couple of questions coming in from Christian as well um, around the screening process and our group's always full. So great question, Christian. We have um, online registration process for participants um, in that they complete all kinds of info about their age, um, they we make sure that they can actually swim. So they have to be able to swim 50 meters. They're fit enough to take part in a surfing lesson. Um, we ask a little bit about their mental health history. So we get some, some basic information when participants register. Um, and then in terms of our groups always full, not necessarily depends on the location that we're operating at. Um, we find that most programs we get around that eight to 10 mark, but it really depends on the type of program we're running and what the need is um, in the community. Yeah, that's the importance of re recruiting to the greater number to account for drop off. But it's also about ensuring that the community partnering organization, we have really great communication with them and make sure that they've got their case managers and case workers supporting their young people coming down. And if it is someone who is a member of the public, it is through the reminders. We actually have text messages that go out in a couple of days leading up to and the, the day before, which remind people really excited to see you tomorrow. The weather might be looking a bit shitty, but that's okay. We go rain, hail or shine looking forward to seeing you at 6 15 ready to kick off at 6 30 a.m for ready for a beautiful sunrise like that that kind of energy is what we really find makes a big difference and translates to people turning up so yeah generally the programs are normally full in the first week and then we'll find that people don't come for certain reasons might have a health appointment or what have you but they generally will come back because they see the benefit of it sometimes in the more unwell groups might be the first episode psychosis or you know, adult population of mental health, they then really struggle with the routine and the, the ongoing eight week program. So it's a few extra little nudges to get them along the way. But great questions there. The only other thing around the process, our process is going to change with Salesforce and we can share that with you as we go. But the funnel questions is really key. Like, are you a male? Are you a female? Are you under the age of 18? Um, do you identify as being Indigenous or Aboriginal? Um, you know, the, the young boy on the screen that you can see right now is a, a beautiful young boy from our Aboriginal program that we run. And he got so much out of this program, but it was about doing it in a way that was culturally appropriate and using people that were, you know, the elders in the community that can really guide us in how we should actually be running this program rather than just thinking, oh, well, what we know, we're just going to put it across to these guys. So using the people who are the, the experts in the field of all, the, all of those different 17 programs that we run means that we can actually do things in a really professional and effective way. Guys, there's so much good vibes coming in in the chat. We thank you so much for being a part of this. We're going to wrap this up because we've gone just over time and we're so, so grateful for all of your energy and your presence today. Isto is a massive, massive evolving beast and we couldn't be more stoked to be a part of that, that beautiful uh, surf therapy love. So sending you good vibes from Sydney, Australia and uh, to all of those challenging places all around the world going through some pretty tough times right now. We've got this. We're all in this together, just like that high school musical song. <laughs> all right, so 
powerful team. Wow. Thank you so much. I, I mean, mental health is just as essential as physical health. Mental health should not be a four letter word. We have the power to change the narrative and it's been in the dark long enough. So I cannot say thank you enough for continuing to help us redefine what, uh, you know, destigmatizing the whole idea of talking about mental health. I love that Foundation WOW continues to respond to and, and adapt to exactly what's happening in the moment um, for you to reach out to shark attack victims or survivors and then also family members. And then the, the response to the wildfires was just incredible. So I cannot say thank you enough on behalf of the ISTO board and all of us out there for all of you who joined us from your living rooms and bedrooms and cars and <laughs> kitchen thank you for bringing us into your home and if you would like your colleagues to see this we'll share it on youtube in about 24 hours yeah. joel phil mark thank you again so grateful enjoy your friday and it is thursday still here in the state so off to the next meeting thanks everybody thank you everybody great job. Bye. thank you mary thank you everybody see you guys thank you Bye -bye. Awesome. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. Ciao. Cool. Marina's on. Run, run, run. Hi, Maria. <laughs> Hi, Maria. <laughs> we love you guys. Have a great day. <laughs>